Welcome back, everyone. Today we're going to start talking about our last big topic, which I'm just going to call the sizes of infinite sets. First things first, I'm going to have to undo something we've said before, which is that previously we've written things like this for the size of sets. That's still good. But if I ask you for the size of an infinite set, I'm no longer just going to write infinity. In particular, I want to talk about what our goal is in this chapter. And our goal in this chapter is to decide what the sizes of infinite sets are and how we should go about comparing the sizes of infinite sets. A lot of what we're going to do in this chapter is going to be very intuitive, and a lot of it is going to be very unintuitive. And so we're going to always be guided by carefully chosen definitions to help us make sure that we're sort of really sticking to the rigorous side of what we mean when we're talking about the sizes of these sets. Now, I should note, this area of mathematics was not developed until the 1800s because it required a rather careful understanding of a lot of the topics that we've been discussing so far. So things about functions being on to, one to one, bijections, and so on, are all going to figure rather intimately into our discussion of infinite sets. Now, here's the first thing I want to make sure to emphasize, and I've said this before, but I want to reiterate it because it's important. In many ways, infinite sets do not behave like finite sets. So I want to get out of the way right away that this is unavoidable, but it is frequently going to lead you to make statements that, though intuitive, are ultimately not true. Now, one way we already have to compare sizes of sets is through the idea of subsets. So here's an idea that I think is pretty intuitive, which is that if A is a subset of B, then the size of A, whatever that thing is, should be less than or equal to the size of B. And in fact, once we are done talking about sizes of infinite sets, we're still going to believe that this is true. So if I take a subset of a set that is infinite, it is going to have either the same cardinality or smaller cardinality. Now, here's the thing that's true for finite sets. For finite sets, if A is a proper subset of B, meaning A is a subset of B, but it's not all of B, then the size of A is strictly less than the size of B. Now, the first thing we're really going to have to accept when we're talking about infinite sets is that this is just not true for infinite sets, and it could never be true for infinite sets. Now, before I go on, I want to make sure I convince you that there is no way we could possibly define sizes of infinite sets that would make it so that this statement was true for infinite sets. And so to do that, I'm going to revisit something we talked about in an earlier video called Hilbert's Hotel. And I'm going to think of Hilbert's Hotel now in terms of what it's telling us about sizes of infinity. So to remind you of the setup, we have a hotel where there's a series of rooms, room one, room two, room three, and so on down the line. And the point is it does not stop. And so I'm going to go ahead and denote by R, this is our set of rooms. Now, I'm going to go ahead and fill the hotel. And the guests in the hotel are going to be the positive integers. And so I'll put one in the first room, two in the second room, three in the third room, and so on down the line. Now, I think you'd agree that because each room has exactly one positive integer in it, it must be the case that the number of rooms is equal to the number of positive integers. And that's very similar to what would happen if you had a hotel that was not infinite. If I told you our hotel has 350 rooms and every room has exactly one person in it, well, then I think you would believe pretty immediately that the hotel had exactly 350 people in it. In the same way, if every room gets filled with exactly one positive integer, it had better be the case that the number of rooms is the same as the number of positive integers. But 
if you remember the story, the whole idea with the story was, okay, but now Zero shows up, and Zero wants a room. And the obvious thing to say is, okay, well, Zero can't have a room. Because all the rooms are full. And really, the argument there is an awful lot like this intuitive idea that for a finite set, if you were to take a proper subset, it would have a smaller size. So, in other words, if somehow it were possible to fill only part of the rooms with all of the positive integers, it would have to take up a strictly smaller number of rooms. But, as we saw when we talked about this the last time, that's just not true, because I can have everyone move down a room, and then that frees up this room, because now one's here, two's here, and so on. And so I can put zero now in this room. And now, if you believed my argument before that the number of rooms has to be equal to the number of positive integers, well, now this picture has to convince you that it must be the case that the number of rooms is equal to the number of non-negative integers. Because, again, there's exactly one number in each of the rooms, so it must be that the number of rooms is the same as the number of non-negative integers. But if I have any faith that this is going to make sense at all, the fact that both the set of positive integers and the set of non-negative integers have the same size as the number of rooms means they must have the same size as each other. Okay, and so this is our first exclamation point. Something weird happened. The size of the positive integers has to be the same as the size of the non-negative integers. And this has to be the case just by thinking about basic ideas of what size means to us. And so, I want to note, this is true even though the positive integers are a proper subset of the non-negative integers. Another way to think about this is to think about this backwards. So, imagine that you have a hotel where every room is full with one person. And then, for whatever reason, you throw someone out of the hotel. Well, now you're guaranteed, just by the way numbers work, that you have an empty room. But we see that in Hilbert's Infinite Hotel, that's not true. Because if I throw out someone, so let's say I throw out number three, then I can just move everyone down a room, and now every room is full again. So what I'm saying here is that the positive integers have this property that if I add a number to them, they stay the same size. And so I could add one, two, three numbers to them, they'll stay the same size. Just shift everyone down one, two, or three rooms. Or I could take out one, two, or three numbers, and they'll stay the same size because I could just shift everyone in the hotel the other way. And so this whole idea of having the same size as the positive integers is strangely flexible. Namely, what we're really arguing here is the following. And so just like we made room to put zero in the hotel, we could just as easily make room to put pi, e, and the square root of two into the hotel. Any finite set of things, I just slide everyone down, and then we're in good shape. We can still fit them in the hotel. And so, whatever the number of rooms in Hilbert's hotel is, that's the number of elements in all of these sets, the positive integers and the positive integers union any finite set. But we could keep going with this story. Let's say that not just a bus with a finite number of people shows up. Let's say a bus with all of the negative integers shows up. Is it possible to fit the negative integers into Hilbert's hotel. So now imagine this poor person who works at the front desk of Hilbert's hotel, which is a very busy job, is working at the desk, and they've just arranged to get zero in by having everyone move. And so the hotel is now full, again, as it was before zero showed up. And now imagine that a whole bus shows up, and indeed, the bus contains every negative integer. So not just a finite number of people have shown up, a now infinite number of new people have shown up, and they want a room as well. 
is it possible for the person at the front desk to make room for this infinite collection of new people who want rooms? Is it possible to clear out infinitely many rooms in this hotel? Now, the first thing you might notice is we can't do what we were doing before. I can slide everyone down as far as I want, but even if I slide them a hundred down, I've only opened up a hundred rooms. There's no way I could slide them infinitely far down. That doesn't make any sense. I know you could argue that none of this makes any sense, but bear with me. But here's what I can do. I can make everyone here move not to the room next to them, but the room that is twice as far down. So zero is currently in the first room, so zero is going to move to the second room. One is currently in the second room, so I'm gonna move one to the fourth room. Two is in the third room, so I'm gonna move two to the sixth room, and so on down the line. Now, if you think about it pretty intuitively, it's just the even-numbered rooms that are occupied now. And so all of the odd-numbered rooms are available. And so if I just do this, I ask everyone to go to the room that's twice as far down the hall as the room they were in. Now I have infinitely many open rooms. And into these infinitely many open rooms, I can go ahead and put all of the negative integers. So here's negative 1, here's negative 2, here's negative 3 and so on down the line. And so rather counterintuitively here, the answer is yes, I can absolutely find room for all of the negative integers. And so it's tempting now that you've seen this to wonder, is there any set that could show up where they wouldn't be able to fit into the hotel? And so you might think of some of the biggest sets you know, so you might think about the rational numbers or the real numbers, and you might ask yourself, could I describe some sort of shuffle of all of these integers to fit the rational numbers into all of these rooms? Or say the real numbers, where I take all the real numbers, could I fit them into these rooms? And that's really the gist of what we're going to be getting at in this chapter. We want to be able to understand exactly what sets of numbers we can accommodate in Hilbert's hotel, and what sets of numbers we cannot. We want to be able to formally and rigorously understand exactly what it means when I say this set could fit into Hilbert's hotel or this set could not. And we want to understand how to prove that a set has that property, or maybe more interestingly, prove that a set does not have that property. So here officially is our definition of what it means when I say that two sets have the same number of elements. Namely, we'll say two sets have the same number of elements, or the same cardinality, if there exists a bijection from A to B. Now I want to point out, secretly or not so secretly, that's exactly what was happening in Hilbert's hotel. Whenever I described there being exactly one person in every room, I was really describing a bijection between the set of rooms and whatever set of numbers happen to be occupying those rooms. Right? Again, if there's exactly one positive integer in every room, then I really have a bijection between the positive integers and the rooms. Likewise, if, as is going on here, I have exactly one integer in every room, and every integer is in a room, then that gives me a bijection between the integers and the set of rooms. Now, I want to point out, where is our motivation for this definition coming from? And the motivation here is really coming from the pigeonhole principle. And in particular, what I called the pigeonhole principle part three. So this is what the pigeonhole principle part three said. It said that if A and B are finite sets, then there exists a bijection from A to B if and only if A and B have the same number of elements. Now, I want to note this theorem that we talked about in the last chapter and this definition are kind of saying very different things. Because when I'm talking about a finite set, the number of elements in it is a positive integer. And I more or less completely understand what it means for a set to have, say, 18 elements. 
And so if I say two sets have both have 18 elements, I know what that means, and I know how to make a bijection between the two of them. If, however, my sets are infinite, I have no idea what it means to say that the two sets are the same size until I look at this definition. So for infinite sets, this statement is not even meaningful until I define it. And the reason for that is at the beginning of this video, I undefined this symbol for infinite sets, right? We used to just write, oh, the size of this equals infinity and not think about it, but we don't get to do that anymore. And so this symbol itself is currently nothing. And so I don't have a name yet for what the size of Z plus is, but I'm agreeing that it's something. And then I'm using this definition to describe what it means for something else to also be equal to that something. Again, that thing doesn't have a name as of yet, but I know what it means for something to be the same size as something else now for an arbitrary set. And the advantage here of the fact that I used the pigeonhole principle as my motivation to make this definition is that it doesn't break anything we've already agreed to for finite sets. Namely, this definition matches exactly our definition for finite sets. And so this now just gets extended to also be true for infinite sets. But what was previously a theorem that could be proven is now just a definition. It's what we've chosen for it to mean for two infinite sets to have the same size. This is a very common pattern in mathematics, by the way, where you will study an object in one context, whatever sort of object it be, prove a bunch of theorems about it, and then you'll try and look at that object in another context where the definition you use doesn't quite make sense. And so then you'll use a theorem about the object from the first context as the definition in the new context. And so quite often, mathematics ends up being a long string of generalizing something by figuring out the right definition to work somewhere new. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give a name to the size of the positive integers. Namely, I'm going to use the name that Cantor did. And Cantor used the name Aloth 0. So, as I said, I have a name for the size of the set 1, 2, 5. Namely, my name for the size of the set 1, 2, 5 is 3. That is my name for it. We've agreed that 3 means, well, however many dots there are there, that's 3. I had not yet named the size of this infinite set. But I now have, namely, I'm going with Aleph 0. Aleph, I should note, is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Most everything you see me use that's not part of the Latin alphabet is part of the Greek alphabet, but here is an exception. This is from the Hebrew alphabet. Why is it from the Hebrew alphabet? Well, the person who discovered all of this was Georg Cantor. And among many, many other things, Cantor was a very devout Jew. And so he was used to using symbols from the Hebrew alphabet in his writing, and this one stuck. Also, fun fact, the Hebrew alphabet does not have vowels. And so while Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that sounds suspiciously like A, it is not a vowel. So the first thing I want to do is formalize our Hilbert's Hotel ideas to show that a couple of these sets have the same size. So namely, I want to show that the size of the integers greater than or equal to zero is also Aleph naught. So, what does this statement mean? Well, this thing is by definition the size of the positive integers. And what does this mean? This means that there's a bijection from the integers greater than or equal to zero to the positive integers. And so this is the kind of translation we're going to have to get used to in this chapter. Namely, we're going to have to get used to looking at this and understanding that what that really wants me to do is prove this statement. So how do I prove a there exists statement? Well, by giving an example, right? So in order to prove that the size of this set is Aleph naught, 
or olive zero if you prefer, I need to give you a bijection from the non-negative integers to the positive integers. And I will suggest a good way to do that. Namely, I want you to take each non-negative integer and send it to itself plus one. Now, the fact that this is a bijection is something I probably should actually check. But fortunately, because of the last chapter, we have lots of practice at checking this. So let's check that it is one to one first. So we get to suppose that x and y are in z sub greater than or equal to zero and f of x equals f of y. Then what does that tell us? That tells us that x plus one equals y plus one. So I can subtract one from both sides. So I get so x equals y. So the function is one to one. And I should check that it's on to. So how do I show it's on to? Well, I pick some element of the codomain. Then I write down an element of the domain that maps to it. And there we go. And so that proves to me that this function I wrote down is a bijection between these two sets, which exactly means they have the same size. And the size of the positive integers is just called a of zero. And so the integers greater than or equal to zero, they also have size a of zero. Now, you should think of alef0 as being a number. It's just a number that's not one of the numbers we're used to. Namely, if you think about it, how many sheep could I have? Well, I could have zero sheep, one sheep, two sheep, three sheep, and so on. And that would give me all the positive integers. But then if I had even more sheep than that, the next number I would come across would be that I had alef0 sheep. That is to say, I would have one sheep for every positive integer, which would take up a lot of space. And so in a natural way, I should think of olef zero as continuing this count of the positive integers. And somewhat implicit in this notation is the idea that I could keep going even beyond that, that I could count up to something bigger than olef zero. And we'll talk about that a great deal too. But this is the conceptual space that this symbol should fill in your head. Okay, so let's do this as another example. Let's prove if I take the set 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on, just all the even integers that are at least 4, let's prove the size of that set is also olive naught. Now, if you want to think about this in terms of subsets, back when we were at the hotel, the examples I did where I put in zero or then brought in the negative integers were things where I started with the positive integers and then made a set that was way bigger by adding in zero first and then all of the negative integers on top of it. And we proved that those, in fact, had the same size as the set of positive integers. In this example, I'm doing the opposite. I'm throwing away a ton of the positive integers, namely all of the odd ones, as well as two, and I want to show that even after I throw away that infinite number of integers, I'm still left with a set that has exactly the same size as the set I started with. Yet again, just to reiterate, this is completely different than the way finite sets work. You start with a finite set, and you throw away even one element. As soon as you've done that, your set is automatically strictly smaller. Whereas here I'm showing you that alef not doesn't work this way. If you take alef naught and you throw away infinitely many things, what's left? Well, it might be infinite, it might be finite, who knows? We'll find out. So what's our proof here going to be? Again, to prove this, I have to remember, what is this saying? To prove that this is alef naught, I am proving that this set has the same size as the set of positive integers. Which is to say, I'm proving there's a bijection between this set and the set of positive integers. In this case, I'm going to let that bijection go the other direction. I'm going to take it to go from the positive integers to this set. And I'm allowed to do that because bijections are symmetric. Namely, if I have a bijection, it's really not directional. Because remember, we get the inverse of a bijection by just sort of flipping the arrows in the other direction. And so every bijection from A to B comes for free with a bijection from B to A. 
And in fact, we even have a name for the bijection from B to A that comes with the bijection from A to B. Namely, we call it the inverse. And so when I want to write down a bijection between two sets, I can always choose which one I would rather have be the domain and which one I'd rather have be the codomain. Because if I want it the other way, I can just take the inverse. And so I think the function I want here is n goes to 2n plus 2. And just like in the previous example, can prove this is one to one and on to. And in the process of doing so, in the process of proving that this is one to one and on to, you've proven that this is a bijection, which then shows you that the size of this set is also Aleph naught. Now I'll note it doesn't need to be the case that one of the sets is z plus in order for me to show that two sets have the same size. So here I'm choosing the open interval 0, 1, and the open interval 3, 7, and I want us to prove that those two sets have the same size. Again, let's translate. What that's asking is for me to prove that there's a bijection from the first set to the second set. So I need to go ahead and write one down. So I think if you toy around with this a bit, you'll come up with a fact that if I take the function x goes to 4x plus 3, that will indeed send the interval 0, 1 to the interval 3, 7. So let's first prove this is on to. So I'll let b be an element of 3, 7. So then I'm going to let a be b minus 3 over 4. How did I get that? That is part of, again, something that would be in scratch work where you're going to solve the output equals b for x, or a in this case, I suppose. Now, here I really have to justify that the a I wrote down is actually in the interval 0, 1. And so to do that, I'm going to start with the fact that b is in the interval 3, 7. So I'm first going to subtract 3 from each of these things. So namely, that's going to give me 0 is less than b minus 3 is less than 4. And then dividing by 4 gives me what I want. And all of that was just by way of showing that this a is really actually in 0, 1. Okay, I still, of course, need to show that if I take f of a, I actually get b. And so that does show me I do, in fact, get b if I plug in a, and so that shows me that this function is really onto. One to one is a bit easier in this case. So I suppose, as usual, when I'm proving something is one to one, that I start with x and y in the interval, and that f of x is equal to f of y, and then that gives me that 4x plus 3 is equal to 4y plus 3. So 4x is equal to 4y, and so I can divide by 4, and I'll get x is y. And so that proves to me that the function I wrote down is really an honest bijection between 0, 1, and 3, 7. And so there are exactly as many real numbers between 0 and 1 as there are between 3 and 7. Mentally, one way to think about this is that we sort of start with the interval from 0 to 1, and that's kind of a solid line of numbers. And so what's really happening is I'm stretching that line out. But because the line is solid to begin with, when I stretch it, it doesn't actually make the line any bigger in terms of the number of points in it. It takes a bit to wrap your brain around, because in a lot of ways it seems like this set should be four times bigger than this set. Uh, and in a lot of ways this set is four times bigger than this set. Uh, but not in this way. In this way, these two sets are exactly the same size. As a final theorem for today, I want to show you that, in fact, the size of the interval 0, 1 is actually the same as the size of the set of all real numbers. So, actually, not only was it true that these two intervals I showed you before had the same size, in fact, any two intervals have the same size because they each have the same size as all of the real numbers combined. Now, I can show you why this is true just by giving you a graph here. Namely, what do I need? I need to give you a graph of a bijection between the real numbers, which I'm going to put on this axis, 
and the interval 0, 1, which I'm going to put on this axis. It's those numbers. And I can sketch one of those like this. This is what's called an S-curve. And probably if you think about it, you know several ways to write down such a function. I'll give you one in a second if you don't like it. But this function's increasing and has an asymptote at 0 and an asymptote at 1, so it's definitely going to give a bijection. And the input is all of the real numbers, and the image is the numbers between 0 and 1. So that'll work. So what is such a function? One such function I could give is to take f from the reals to the interval 0, 1. I'm going to take x to... And so the graph of arctangent very roughly has this shape. But arctangent, we agreed in a previous video, actually returns things between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And so I want to bump that up to not go as low as minus pi over 2. I only want it to go as low as 0. So I'm going to add pi over 2 to it. And so now, instead of ranging from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, once I add pi over 2, this now ranges from 0 to pi. And so if I divide this by pi, then this will in fact have exactly the desired range between 0 and 1. This is, again, very counterintuitive. Maybe when the intervals were 0, 1, and 3, 7, it was kind of easy to imagine stretching the interval, and so taking the shorter interval and sort of like an elastic band stretching it to go over the longer length. Here, though, I'm saying if you start with a rubber band of length 1 and you stretch it, somehow you end up stretching it to be infinitely long without changing the size of the rubber band. That's basically what this is saying if we think about rubber bands as being defined in this particular fashion. By the way, I'll just note, I'm not officially proving that this is a bijection, because the way we would prove it would be to take the derivative of arctangent and show that it's always positive, which would show that this is increasing, and then we would show that the horizontal asymptotes of this function are at 0 and 1. But all of that sounds like stuff we're going to need a whole bunch of axioms or theorems to prove that we don't have. So I'm going to go with this picture and putting the word theorem in front of it uh, and let you accept this. But I would not ask you to prove this because it would require doing a lot of calculus. And we have not been requiring calculus. So as a last thing to contemplate today, I want to contemplate the question, is the size of r the same as aleph 0? In other words, are there the same number of real numbers as the number of positive integers? And at first, of course, your reaction is, well, of course not, there's way more. But so far, that instinct hasn't worked out super well, because, of course, there are way more integers than positive integers, except it turns out there's exactly the same number. So it's quite natural to look at this and not know. Maybe you believe you know and have a guess, and that's fine. But I want to think about what is it we'll actually have to prove one way or the other. So there's two universes. One of them is that the answer is yes. If the answer is yes, then I'll have to give an example of a function from the positive integers to the real numbers that's a bijection. Or, of course, we could go the other way from the reals to the positive integers, as we argued before. That's not super appealing. Uh, it seems difficult to figure out how to do this. But I also want to think about what's going to happen if the answer is no. If the answer is no, then I'm going to have to prove the negation of this definition. And I want to carefully think about what the negation of that definition is. And the definition was there exists a bijection from A to B. So in particular, this there exists becomes a for every. So in particular, we would have to prove that for every function from the positive integers to the real numbers, F is not a bijection. And I would argue that as messy, perhaps, as this first piece looks, this looks way worse. Because here, I don't get to just look at one function. Here, I somehow have to consider simultaneously every possible function from the positive integers to the real numbers. And we've been experiencing this for the whole class, 
every time I have to prove a for every statement, it's just worse than proving a there exists statement. But, ultimately, the answer is no. And so I'm not going to prove this yet, but I will prove it later. And so this is probably the first theorem I've ever written down that has a name on it, but you'll see quite often when people say the theorem, they'll put in parentheses the name of the person who proved it. Uh, and in this case, this is a theorem of Cantor. And what Cantor proved was the size of the positive integers is not the same as the size of the real numbers. In particular, there is no bijection from the positive integers to the real numbers. So I did a section earlier that I called Famous Proofs, where I proved that the square root of 2 was irrational and that there's infinitely many primes. This is another theorem that is an incredibly famous proof that I will definitely give you later and talk about all the repercussions for it. But to leave off today, I want to note that since this set has a different size than the size of the positive integers, I want to give it a different name. So remember we called the size of the positive integers Aleph 0. I am going to call the size of the real numbers Aleph C. You will also see people call this Aleph 1. Calling it Aleph 1 raises all kinds of questions that we're not ready to answer yet, like is there anything in between? So I'm just going to not bias it. I'm just going to call it Aleph C, which is also quite common. Why C? Because the real numbers were historically called the continuum. And so in this intro video, you have learned what it means for two sets to have the same size, what it means for two sets to have different sizes, and you've learned that there are, in fact, at least two different sizes of infinite sets, and you've learned names for the sizes of them, namely Aleph 0 and Aleph C. In the next video, we're going to continue this story and dive deeper into some of the other sets that live between the positive integers and the real numbers. But I think that's a good place to end this video. So I'll wrap up there. And I'll see you next time.